Awesome. Hey everyone, my name is Sam. My pronouns are they, them, and I'm the member experience manager at Advent Coworking. We are a creative co-working space, event space, uh, wellness center, art gallery, um, many things, but most importantly, we are a community and we love having the opportunity to lift up our members and share about them and learn from them. Um, so this event today, it's our Advent member talks. Um, you know, just last week we celebrated one year of these talks. We love this event. Each week features a different member on the topic of their choosing. Um, so if you're an Advent member, if you haven't presented yet, hit me up. We'd love to be able to promote you. Um, and I'm really excited today that we have Asia joining us. Um, and Asia's going to be talking about recording her first audiobook uh, for her book that just came out. So I hope it's all good things about our podcast studio, but it's a process. <laughs> so if you have any questions for Asia throughout the talk, um, you know, please just put those in the comments and we're going to have a short Q&A at the end. So Asia, I will hand it over to you. Thank you, Sam. And thank you to Advent uh, Coworking for sharing the platform, allow me to, to share my platform here. So as Sam said, I just published my first book, Bring Me Back Home New Orleans last month. And this is a poetry collection dedicated to my hometown, New Orleans. And I actually had my first virtual book launch at the end of December, which went really well. And I had, I would say successful because it was a community uplift circle. And so a lot of family and friends, who were reunited on this call. And also these are all were people who were a part of my journey, uh, pre-Katrina, um, post-Hurricane Katrina. That's, and that's where um, my inspiration for the book came from as a Hurricane Katrina survivor. So this was my processing, my relationship with New Orleans through this book. So I'm excited it's released. Um, at this time, I'm actually working on my first audiobook, as Sam said. And uh, this is also special to me because I'm also a spoken word artist. So I've been writing since 2009. I was about 16 years old. And I became a spoken word artist in 2012 on the campus of, UNC of uh, UNCW, UNC Wilmington. And from there, that lit a, a passion, a fire in me to for the performing, the, the spoken word to um, for performance poetry. And so it was fitting for me to not just have the uh, physical copy of the book uh, of poetry, but also to have an audio book uh, to share. So I'm excited that should be released by next month. Um, in this call, in this talk, I am actually going through three lessons that I'm learning along the way <laughs> for recording an audiobook. So my first lesson that I wanted to bring up is to, first of all, set a timeline, uh, set a, a timeline for when you plan to uh, publish your audiobook. For me, um, I was working with a close friend of mine who is now a book publishing consultant. And in, and before we, we really hammered down on the timeline, we just had a conversation about what my goals were. And when I mentioned I wanted the book published before 2021, uh, she immediately went into work mode and, and got me on two timelines. So uh, my, my, uh, my book is currently available in paperback and Kindle on Amazon. And at the beginning, I originally planned to publish my audiobook together. So ebook, paperback, audiobook. So which is helpful is to have a timeline. So I have two. So, <laughs> so uh, exhibit A, I'll call this one was, if you're gonna do your, your book, in an ebook and your audiobook published at the same time, then have a schedule, write it out for when you're gonna edit and uh, you do mock recordings. Um, but editing takes the longest time, I think that's what I've, I've learned and probably some other authors would, 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 would uh, agree to that is that was the, 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 the most arduous process. And uh, exhibit B was paperback and ebook only. So for me through my process, we really started um, November. So I already had the book written, but uh, when it came time to, I want it done by before December 31st, I uh, realized, and, and this is one point I will make under this, is to, to consider your time constraints. So for me, I realized toward the end of November, it was Thanksgiving, uh, first time I joined Advent uh, co-working and uh, visited the podcast studio space. And that was uh, the reason why was so I could record there. And I had to move. I, I could not record that that month. I actually had my 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 
different priorities and um, it was difficult for, for me to, to, to meet get all those hours and so I, December I said well I'll, I'll um, move to, to, to December for the audiobook but I realized soon that uh, this was not going to happen <laughs> I had to I the when you see how fast the time is going and, and it's like the priority is my book is that needs to be out first by December 31st so I had to switch to exhibit B so it's very important that you have a timeline and write it down and if uh, if if you're working with someone, definitely to have an accountability partner to keep you on that timeline if it's hard for yourself. Um, sometimes I struggle with that as well. So that brings me to my next point. When you are ready to uh, start recording your audiobook, I would say make sure that you have a separate audiobook script. And so uh, it, audiobook script is you have your 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 uh, paperback, your draft of your book, and it's formatted in a way where you it allows you to pause between chapters or between poems. Uh, one thing that helped me actually, I used my my phone, have Android, so I just used the audio recorder app on my audio recording app on my phone. And so I, I, that was the first test recording I did. And what that helps um, if you are planning to record in the studio is recording on your phone, doing those mock recordings. It helps you to pick up the, the breathiness that you have. You know, I, I learned, uh, it was pointed out to me actually in college by an advisor uh, when I performed that. He said, you know, you, you take a lot of, you breathe a lot. You notice you draw a lot of breaths when you're speaking. Did you know that? And I said, no. And so that's one thing when you are recording on your phone, at least, it's, it's a mock recording, so it's not, you know, official. You can hear yourself. You can also, what I learned is you, you learn the emphases on certain words and phrases when you're actually reading your poems aloud. So if I go back to eight, nine years ago now, 2012, when I first started, before I uh, started uh, or performed my first poetry slam, I just chose three poems that just spoke to me as I was reading them. I didn't have a formula for how to say it, how to emphasize, what to emphasize. I just read and it's like, this speaks to me, I'm gonna say it. And when I read it aloud, I naturally emphasized certain words. And that just became a part of my, that standard for that particular poem. And so it's very helpful to do a mock recording before you get um, in the studio. And uh, which leads me to my third point is that when you are ready to go to this, the podcast studio, if you are uh, planning on on, record, on recording that way, do schedule at least the day off. <laughs> if you're working in the traditional, you know, nine to five, like um, I am, and, and typically my job could be all day uh, practically. So if you are, especially if it's a demanding job, and you don't really know where to find the break or find that pause to record. It's so important uh, to make sure you are fully focused when you are ready to record. I will say, going back to uh, an earlier point that I mentioned about the podcast studio, saying great things. It's, it's lovely. <laughs> the first time I've, I've visited, I love the space. Uh, just the whole co-working space is amazing. But um, for me, I, I, uh, I was rushing <laughs> last month. I was uh, trying to uh, get one of my hours and make time to record. And the issue was, it was a Friday. I was sort of midway into work. I still had my work to do and it was like three, four o'clock in the afternoon. But I said, if I break away and go record, um, at least I can knock an hour out. But I went and I was disorganized <laughs> to be, um, you know, transparent is that I, I, I did not have just, just the basic setup protocols. I overlooked when I was in the studio. So you, you wipe down and, and our, you know, this current pandemic. So just make sure cleanliness, I, I, I sanitized everything and that was about it. I did not have um, um, the Wi-Fi code on me. I did not, so I overlooked all the protocols that were right in front of me, but I was saying, well, I don't have, I can't retrieve the Wi-Fi. It was almost like a skeleton crew. It was like right around Christmas, I believe, Christmas Eve I went. So um, I, overlooked a lot of things and I did record. And then I realized at the end, um, this, I never turned the soundboard on. So <laughs> I, um, at the, you know, my, my uh, SD card did not pick up. It was like 30, 35 minute reading. And so I was like, oh my goodness, I did end up calling Sam. <laughs> and she, you know, helped me out uh, with that. But that's just, just an example of when you go in not prepared, you can go in with good intentions, but if you are not prepared, 
you are going to, you know, you make yourself uh, unproductive, not um, not productive. So it, that was just a, a lesson for me to say when you are ready to actually record in the studio, you make sure you go in there that you ha you don't have any other distractions. You're not taking, you know, if if you're still working that day. For me, it it, it just impeded um, the energy I could have used to actually record. And so, uh, very very just big lesson there um, for recording. That was my third lesson. But one thing I did want to do before I close, and this feels really, really short than what I had <laughs> written down, but I wanted to share a sample of from my audiobook and or from my 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 actual book, Bring Back Home to New Orleans. And I'm not sure if I shared it yet, but this is it. Um, but I wanted to share a title, the title poem from my book and a little background. So I wrote this poem in 2013. I lived in uh, North Carolina since 2006. Um, it's like a year after Hurricane Katrina. So my high school years, college, undergrad, grad school were spent in North Carolina. A lot of my adolescent and, and uh, personal professional development was shaped out in uh, North Carolina. But um, my, desire for, my desire for New Orleans, my yearning for New Orleans often um, just sort of repeatedly followed me at every stage of my life where uh, no matter where I was or lived in or, or any point in my life, um, uh, my journey, especially in college, as I was writing more poetry and, and performing, that I still um, had this draw to New Orleans and, and, and missing it as far as what it used to be for me before, before the storm. And so this particular poem for me just epitomizes my relationship with New Orleans and it's entitled, Bring Me Back Home, New Orleans. Dear New Orleans, I miss you. Crescent City, I love you. Past tense now invades the present. Oh, Mississippi. No more promenading along the city boardwalks. Virgin Records, no more radio wave transmission. I think that the fuel of New Orleans has already expired, forever exhausted, but I still call you home. My accent may not reveal me and my subdued ways may not proclaim me, but my heart, my heart will always remember you Jazzy Blues, Jackson Square Cafe du Mans, Adeste Fidelis, my soul longs to be back home by the bayou. Take me to the lakefront old boot town. I want to saunter back along the hilly grasslands of the UNO residence. Scrape at my patella once again against the pebble stone sidewalks. Run my bike down the steep stone shortcut of the gentilly decline, you are mine my hometown, my native land, my birthplace, the formation of my identity, Old Crescent City, has been too long. Eight years without you, maybe now, I'm beginning to feel the growing pains from 12 to 20. Couldn't even spend my full adolescence with you again, Mississippi, you see. City Park was my playpen. Magnolia trees stretching as if to fit all of God's children in between the two stone statue body lions, accumulating tag games in the day and saying farewell to newly made friends in the evening. Oh, New Orleans, how I miss you. I miss the cracks in the uneven sidewalks, the sounds of police sirens swiftly passing through my Rodderly neighborhood at night. You see, lived in the corner, directly eyeing Walgreens, Perpendicular to Ferrara's oh, that neighborhood market now just a windy slot. And Marion Central, my brother Jonathan's neighborhood school. And St. Francis Cabrini, my two years of middle school now demolished. And Mardi Gras. Who would have known that the last bead thrown to me would become one of my few salvageable memories? Tears quickly became tears, the rift of a girl from her home to a foreign land, the replay of a lotto Equiano forcefully taken from his native land, 
the German redemptioners who embedded their culture into Creole lands. In Hubix Pies, daddy's favorite always purchased a local shell station where a home lay nearby. Perfectly positioned as if to capture all of the Crescent City's attention, I think that in my heart I've been waiting, wishing to have my last dance with the Riverwalk at the Mississippi before Katrina's government said not anymore entertain myself once again, engage in a body paralysis with a French Quarter street art performer. Take me back to when past tense was present this, when area code 704 was a 504 residence, when crawfish and catfish were available less than five miles away, when street cars were live impressions of antique figurines, when family and friends lived in wars, parishes and faux births from I-10 to New Orleans East, I tried to hold on to all of the memories, but now as I've ushered into my early 20s, I received myriad reminders of life back home. And in a town where avarice seems to rule local powers, all desire is now gone to call New Orleans my future palace, but oh, Mississippi, how I yearn for you. Crescent City, I love you. Dear New Orleans, I miss you. Thank you. That's, <laughs> uh, Sam, that is all I have. <laughs> that was beautiful. Thank, Thank you, you so much for sharing that piece with us. I, in the comments on this video, y'all, I um, did share um, this poetry collection so you can go and check it out. Um, and when we post this video on our YouTube channel, I've been corking videos, I'll include the link there. So I'm really looking forward to, to reading the collection. Um, and I appreciate you sharing that piece. It was really beautiful. Oh, thank you. Uh, so if anyone has any questions, please go ahead and comment those. I know we have a little bit of a delay between us here on Zoom and Facebook. Um, but, you know, while we wait for those questions, this is not related to the title of the talk, but poetry, when did you first start writing poetry? What kind of brought you to that uh, mode of communication? For me, I was... 16 years old, but for me, um, it was a few things. So I was just going through own personal struggles at that time. Um, it's just from being a junior in high in high school to senior. And it's just a few things I was battling and, um, and part of it was just myself too, battling just sort of, um, accepting myself in, in my, um, being introverted. And there's a lot of things I was just struggling with. I, I call it the battle inside and other things. And then I will say one person, um, I'll say Michael Jackson's passing actually pushed me to, to write. Um, so he posthumously inspired me because, um, this long story short, I, I, I came out the womb loving Michael. And for me, he was the soundtrack of my life. And, um, when he passed, it was, it, it brought, it, it kind of forced other things already inside of me. And I, I call, I say this actually in the beginning of my book, um, this, it was, this was 10 years of emotional bleeding. And, um, and that was a part of it. it and I, I was, I, and so my early writings were very melancholy. <laughs> uh, I, I can't say it's dark, but it was, it was about processing like the death process. And in that I was writing about New Orleans. I, and I wasn't even, I always journaled. Um, but I, uh, I'm not sure I lost you, Sam. <laughs> um, oh, there you go. <laughs> but I always, uh, I always journaled, but, um, when I just started writing, I said like the levy walls came down, things that I didn't even know that I was processing internally were coming out on paper. And I would just, I just kept writing and I, I didn't have, um, like a standard of writing. Some of my poems are upside down. I just was like, I need a space. <laughs> and, and, uh, for me, that was healing. It was cathartic for me. So a lot of my early poems, 2009, two of them are featured in the book. Um, my testimony is the beginning and, um, I call it my journey through the healing waters. And then, uh, lights out is another poem I wrote in, um, and, and house gone, actually three of them I wrote in uh, high school. So I think all of that helped uh, just help me process things I didn't know I needed to heal. Um, so that's, that's where it started. Nice. Um, so yeah, some questions um, in regards to recording, you mentioned having a 
um, like a specific recording script. Can you talk about the difference between, you know, that script and just, you know, what's written in, in the book? Yeah, so the script was a draft. So um, my friend, sorry, my timer went off. <laughs> my was uh, helping me. It was It's the draft of your actual book in a PDF form, but there is just sections where it'll say, um, just introduce this as a reading of Bring Me Back Home New Orleans. And um, so it's it's really just kind of uh, for you to just, even for the year, I have the year that I wrote the poems the, at the bottom of each poem, um, the year would just say written in 2009. So when I'm recording, I'll say written in 2009. So it's um, just little markers in your draft, like highlights just to let you know. And especially when you're at the end of your, uh, your, your reading, um, just to say, this has been a recording of this title, Bring Me Back Home New Orleans or whatever your title is. So um, for me, it was the same amount of pages, it just maybe one extra page just to close out. So just add those little markers for yourself in between when you're transitioning, if that makes sense. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. And you you talked a little bit about just kind of the, the challenges in you know learning the studio and recording and the things that you, um, that you learned, but is there anything that you really loved about recording your audiobook? You know, it's a performance. I have fun performing. <laughs> um, and I I don't do it often. Like since I uh, really graduated from UNCW, that's, there was sort of a, uh, what is the word? Um, a break. It's not the word I was looking for, but a break between me actually performing. But whenever, when, um, when I was looking at the, the poems and just, especially there's a couple of them uh, that I've actually performed on open mics, uh, the one I perform now, Bring Back Home to New Orleans, is another one titled Childhood Fever that I um, performed at a poetry slam in college. So some, I'd had fun with those, going back to those poems that it's been a while since I performed them. So I would say performing gives me a, a joy because it's like having a, a conversation, but it's, 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 um, I don't know, it's, it's joy, it gives me joy. Yeah, that's great. And that I, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking that then also gives the reader or the listener an opportunity to kind of understand those words more directly from you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that difference from when you're reading, kind of thinking about your own emotions versus actually hearing, you know, your voice and, and what that brings to it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm excited for it to get released. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, me too. I need, to, I need to go back to the podcast studio. So you'll see me again. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, yeah, awesome. Um, let me see. So I, I know you didn't mention this on the talk, but I know you also are interested in writing children books. Mm -hmm. um, can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, I have one in really much in the ideation stage. It was already, it was written in high school, actually in a creative writing class. And this is one I, um, I it was on a construction paper. <laughs> so very, it was a, it's a children's, like a children, you know, little children's book, but I took it out because I had I have a binder from my creative writing class and I was over 10, that was 11, 12 years ago. I don't know how long it was, but I have a binder with all of my writings from that time, that class. And that was one of them. So for inspiration last year, I put it on my bookshelf to say, you're going to get this published. Um, I'm working with an illustrator on just bringing it to life. And it's beautiful that when you find someone who, and this is a family friend who's already gifted in this area, but when you when you, it's interesting when you bring it to your idea to someone who they 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 can capture your 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 vision just and it, it's amazing so it's um it's an ideation stage still is very uh young so i i, I would hope by january 2022 um end of this year actually <laughs> preferably but um that's the first that's the only one that i have so it's already um uh, and draft, but it's just uh, needs to get to the process phase. <laughs> cool, for sure. Um, well, you know, when folks are reading your poetry book um, or collection, rather, excuse me, is what is something that you really want them to to take from your writing? I I hope that I hope that they feel the writing, they feel the words. I hope that. Um, uh, uh, some people, they, they've told me that, you know, they, they were transported there if they had not visited New Orleans. And so I hope that it is that visual, that experience where they can feel where, like, they're with me in the poem. And also it's, um, I hope they also see it as a personalized expression of um, a, a just, 
a New Orleans native and um, Hurricane Katrina survivor, there were so many stories out and um, even in the early beginnings where we didn't have access to what was going on in the city when we couldn't be in the city in the early like month, August, September of, of um, when the storm hit. But it's just when you have all the neat, the media outlets and they have all their narratives going here and there and it's global. And I also think of it as just great to have one, one story, but one personalized narrative of someone from the storm. It's not just that person from New Orleans in here, but it's just, I hope you, you could really see the narrative of someone from New Orleans and at that time, you know, during Hurricane Katrina. Yeah, that's so important to, to actually hear the perspective from folks who were there and not just what the news was covering. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really great. Well, thank you so much, Asia, for coming and talking to us and um, sharing those lessons about recording your first audiobook. If folks want to get in touch with you, get to know you better, um, learn more about your book, how can they do that? So I'm on Instagram. So I, uh, so underscore, by, at underscore Bayou Girl. <laughs> so at underscore Bayou Girl. And also uh, at Bring Me Back Home New Orleans. Also that you could follow um, just ongoing, this um, promotion, the information about the book. When I release my audio book, you have that update immediately. So underscore Bayou Girl and um, Bring Me Back Home New Orleans. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who's joined us today. Um, when we add this to, you know, up to our YouTube channel, I'll definitely include those links. Um, you know, we really appreciate all of our members who come on and share their skills with us um, and their experiences. So I hope that you'll come back and join us again next Tuesday, 4.30, Facebook Live. Um, next week, we're going to be joined by um, Ohavia, who some of you may know from our, our previous events. So Thank you, Asia. Really appreciate your time. Congratulations on the book um, and look forward to reading it. Thank you so much. Thanks for your support and thank you for hosting this. Thank you everyone who joined it as well. Yeah. All right, y'all have a good evening. <laughs>